So today's date is the uh, 19th, of, 19th of July um, 2004. My name is Ben Fielding. And this interview is for Ming Island Institute, British Chinese Workforce Heritage Project. Can I begin by asking your name? Um, my full name is uh, Kwong Hon Yi, and uh, also I have an English name, Paul. And when were you born? Uh, I was born in Hong Kong, yeah. And whereabouts were you born? Uh, in the peninsular part of Hong Kong, it's called Kowloon. And can you tell me a little bit about your family? Yes, um, well, I, I suppose uh, I come from a, like a working class family. Uh, when I was in, uh, born in Hong Kong, my father worked, um, I think he was an antique dealer. And in those times, uh, because of the economic situation in Hong Kong, it is hard to make a living. And then through some um, acquaintances uh, who have established some sort of catering business in uh, Manchester, he decided that he would uh, emigrate to Britain. That was in uh, 1961 or something, early part. And then when he settled in here, he then um, bring us children over. Because I think at the time we, we were British citizens of the United Kingdom and Crown Colonies, so came over here, it wasn't too much of a hassle. So I came over here when, in 1966, in June. Um, and what education did you have? In Hong Kong, I, I reached uh, to the level of secondary school, and although we, we, we could speak a bit of English when we come over, but of course not very fluent. So I went to a college and then subsequently I have a bit with my, uh, my brother father's catering business. They did a fish, uh, fish and chips takeaway. But at the time, I, I still was an adolescent. I thought the work was too hard. So I thought it wasn't a life for me. I, I can't carry on working all those very long hours. And I thought um, I'd do something else. And, and one, one other thing at the time, I think there were a lack of uh, nursing staff, so I decided to apply for it because it meant a lot of things. You see, we get accommodation for free as well as a job and training. So I decided to go into nursing in 1969 to train as a nurse. Um, and when you were in the fish and chip shop, what was your normal day look like? Well, during the daytime, obviously, I went to college and then after after my study, I came home and then uh, we were expected to help out in the, in the chippy. So after w whatever school work I have, we start to help out. For example, in the back kitchen area, we have to do like peeling potatoes. <laughs> I remember in very cold winter time we have to peel off the you know the spots of the potato by bare hand it was frozen cold <laughs> very cold yeah and those are lots of work and especially during the weekend we expect to help out quite late because um, the business run as such that uh, you know when when the bar finished say about 11 p.m and it's quite a busy time so we expect to stay up late in order to, to meet the demands of the customers so we lay to bed on the weekends. Okay. And uh, was it partly the work in the, in the chippy that you kind of wanted to get away from? So you moved into oh yes, because I realised you know that is a very tough life, and uh, if I got anywhere, I want to get away from it. And I, I suppose that that's uh, you know like in the other. Community, the second generation, you have speed of aspiration. You know, if your parents, they have not much of a choice. That's why they have to be in, in the catering business because of the language barrier. But if I had got a choice, I will not want to continue that. So I decided to take up some uh, vocational training in nursing and get away from it. Yes. Um, and how long did your uh, family own the business? They run the business. Well, my, my father and my mother run the business. With with help of my other siblings. How long did it uh, go on for? Uh, how long did it go on for? Well, when when I entered into nursing, obviously my 
younger sisters and brothers are still helping the chippy and carrying on to in, into the 70s, yes. Okay. Um, and just tracking back a little bit, when, what was the year that you came to the UK? What year? 1966, June. Um, I was very lucky because that, that was the year there was a World Cup going on and Britain wins World Cup. <laughs> yes, I remember that quite clear. Um, and why was it you came? Did you come to Manchester originally? Yes, yes. My my father uh, he, he came to Manchester through some uh, acquaintances, and he established this this sort of catering business. And did you come to Manchester just simply because he knew people in the area, or was there a, was there another reason why like why Manchester went? Why because it already already some link has been established in Manchester. That's why I come. Okay. And um, how, did you did you find it difficult to the, the balance when you were working at the Chippy um, with your education? Uh, I don't think that was um, an issue at the time because you, we were expected to help anyway, isn't it? So it was not a matter of choice. You, we, we don't have choice you are, because, you know, my parents have to make a living and you're part of a family member. In our culture, you expect to help. You cannot just stand by and let them carry on. And what do you think your parents' experience was in your own business? Oh, I think it is quite a tough time. Because not only running a business, they have a family to look after, I think, especially for my mother. Because, you know, apart from being a, house, a housewife, obviously, and then you have to also be you know, like a chef in the kitchen, isn't it? So they, they actually have played dual role you know, for women in, in particular. My father is a main you, so looking after the business. But, as a male, I, I think they have, they have much, uh, a bit easier road to get away than for, for, for women, the Chinese women at the time. And so what was your first job outside of the family business? Yes, I think I was the first one to decide to get away from the family. And what was the job? Pardon? Oh, 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 sorry, this is my only job. Well, into nursing, yeah, and then my career progress from there, yes. Um, and how how is it you were able to get a job in nursing? Well, I, I think oh, I don't know how. I think it was a customer who was a regular customer at the, at the fish and chips, and she was saying, you know, have you think about doing something else, you know? And then she gave me some information, you know, and I just wrote and applied. You know, to start my training, as simple as that. So you just through the words of the customer, because obviously I, at the time I was young, I didn't know you know any other formal thing. But through this customer, I, were, I was able to get my foot into it. Yeah. So it just happened to be within healthcare. Yeah, she she, she just mentioned something like this. So, so I thought, oh well, she explained that you be into your training at the time they give you like accommodation. Uh, for free, and then you, you got meals included, and you just have to work as training. So I thought, oh, well, I think it's a good idea. The end of the day is that basically they would, I'll get the qualification, which is recognised. So I was thinking, if I had any intention of going back to Hong Kong, the qualif qualification may also be useful. And what was your day to day role in this position in nursing? In nursing, when I first started, I was a student. So it's like a student formal training, student nurse training, which it took three years. And when, did you, when, when you finished the student uh, aspect, where did you go to work? So when I finished my, my student training, I, I become a qualified nurse and I work uh, a short time in Manchester at my training hospital, Whittington Hospital, and uh, there was some other job come up in crew, so I decided to apply, get you know more experience, so I worked in crew. Cheshire for part of the time and then I and then there was some other job come back come up in Manchester in an intensive care unit so I applied for the job and come back to Manchester. Um, and what do you think about your current job what do you think the best thing about it is? My current job right I, I've been working as a health visitor 
uh, for the NHS since 1987, so it's quite a long time. And, and I actually retired from my full-time work. I work part-time now because I retire two days a week. Uh, because essentially there's a huge lack of a health visitor in in UK. So they wanted those retired to, to be able to come back to work in some sort of capacity. So I decided to talk up the offer and come back to work for two days a week. My major challenge for, for my job in the NHS is like anything else about resource. There's uh, not enough resource for the frontline staff, I think. That's my personal opinion. So whereas in the health centre there used to be say 12 and now it could be only 5 members of the staff doing the same caseload work. And can you um, briefly explain as a health visitor what, what that means? Okay. Uh, my role is essentially concerned with uh, children within a family ha a household. And the children are aged from birth to four and a half years old. Uh, my role is uh, primarily to do with the uh, welfare, the well-being of the child in the context of the family. So we work by health promotion and we need to also work with other agencies in terms of safeguarding children. So we work with a range of community agencies such as family doctors, uh, short start establishments, um, if necessary we work along other specialists when the, when the child's needs demand, for example like speech therapy, optoptics, etc. And also with social services where it is needed. And what's the, what are the biggest challenges you face in the world? Biggest, biggest challenge is to find enough time in my day to carry out the work that is required from me. So it is always uh, about prioritisation. But that's totally the limit how much I can prioritise because you, know, you have all this different demand on my role in a day, in my working day, but you know, there's only one of me, I can only allot so much time. So it's its greatest challenge, is prioritising what is actually the most important part on, of the job, of the day, for that day. Yes. And have these working conditions uh, changed? Have they gotten more difficult over the years? Or? It certainly is more difficult. It's more difficult because in Manchester in particular, they have not acknowledged there's a huge shortage, over 100 staff short of the required establishment. So nationally, the government also recognised, and that's why they're into a programme of training more health visitors to meet the demands. Because the government itself has its own agenda. They have certain things, for example, the Healthy Child programme. They want all these um, health service provided to, to provide that service. But in order to do, carry out that service, fully and effectively, you need resources. But at the moment, although we're training, but people are still in training, so we haven't got a full established figure, manpower, to carry on what is required, in my opinion. So it's an issue of um, labour supply within health visitors, but there's not enough skilled people, as opposed to um, the resources available. Well, I'm speaking uh, you know, with reference to Manchester's uh, context because, of, of course, when you train health visitors, student health visitors, when they qualify, they also are attracted by other, uh, what you call, an established establishment in the surrounding area of Manchester. If they have a better condition, uh, less demanding caseloads, of course, you know, they, 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 they will leave the post. I mean, in spite of they being quite, uh, trained in Manchester. So I think also about retention of staff, uh, uh, as well as uh, recruitment of staff. But you need to retain what you've trained, because at the moment, after the students are trained, they're leaving the post, because they're, they're, whether because they're attracted by better working condition in other health or uh, in, in NHS trust near us in Manchester. And how many hours do you tend to work? 
I work 15 hours per week. But when part time, time you're doing. Um, so I do seven and a half hours per day for two days a week. Um, and can you tell me as well about your work with the Chinese Health Information Centre and when that began? Ah, right. So that stemmed from the history. So I was working as a charge nurse at, um, at one of those hospitals in Manchester on the intensive care unit. So I was in charge of uh, the unit and that means looking in terms of uh, manpower, etc. to cover 24 shifts in the hospital. And then, um, of course, like any other job, it's quite demanding, but at the time I get to know that the Chinese Health Information Centre requires a Cantonese-speaking health visitor to help out the project uh, at the time. So they, they, they said they were able to link with the health trust. They were willing to sponsor somebody to, for the study. So I applied for it and I, I got the post at the time. That's, you know, looking back when I was a student health visitor. Um, at the time he says, uh, part of my role, other than working with family, with children, is to devote a number of hours per week working with the Chinese community within uh, Chinese Health Information Centre in Manchester. So you've been working with the centre for quite a few mm, years? Yes. And has that role stayed the same? Or is it no, 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 because it's evolved, evolved in, in, in itself. Because um, when this centre was first established, it was from some sort of King's Fund, I think it was Section 64 King's Fund, which itself is limited in terms of time, like, say about 10, 10 years, and this funding then gradually runs up. So by the end, when before the money ran out for CHIC, we, as, and then I joined um, CHIC as member of the management committee. So we, we have to start something. How, how, how do we then continue the service when money is running out and a lot of our client users also at the time feeling quite frustrated so they went to have demonstration protests at so-called gateway house the health st strategic health authority about you know the imminent closure of the center so with our client support and our way of thinking we evolved ourselves into a charity body so when it was first being like like a project funded thing from king's fund we become a charity body some time ago. So from that on we also think about how can we generate funds. So one of our fun uh, event is to have charity dinner evening. We have it every year from where we can generate you know, uh, some fund to sustain the centre. And then we come into contract negotiation with the NHS Trust that is from, uh, from Manchester, and we carry out some work for them, and then we get reimbursement from them. But we are very you know, fortunate in a way that Manchester Health Authority at the time was quite um, helpful in the way that they continue to sponsor two member of staff for this centre on a continual basis. That is the centre manager post, they fund it for 35 hours a week, and then a clerical part-time worker, say, for 15 hours a week. So those are two posts that's funded by the NHS Trust, and still being so. But the other bit of the funding, we have to generate contractual work, whether in terms of interpreting other services, doing projects, uh, to get money generated, generated at the centre. Mm. Because we don't charge our client users. So in, in your role as a managing director? Um, I'm a member of the management committee. Management committee. Yeah. Um, one thing you just spoke about was fundraising. Yes. And the importance of that. Is there any other, ro other roles or duties you have in the centre? Oh, m my role for this centre, apart from being a member of the management committee, whereby we also make some strategic <coughs> decisions as, you know, where we're heading, etc., in terms of day-to-day -day working for CHIC, I work in the capacity of a volunteer. I, I led some sort of a healthy walking group on Fridays uh, for the elderly, well, mainly elderly people. So 
uh, 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 we, we walk around certain route within Chinatown or sometimes outside Chinatown in Manchester. But we did have training. We were trained by the Ramblers Association of Manchester about you know, safety route, how to be the guy and certain safety precautions. And then we think, on well, actually, we, we do the group quite successfully at, at the moment. We have, a, on average, every week, about 30, 30 to 35 members, committee members, you know, take part in this walking group. And also, other than being a volunteer, and also volunteer to do help promotion thing, event, when it, it demands, when it's needed. For example, like tomorrow we have a health promotion event in Chinatown, which I, I agree to help out uh, in terms of uh, like measuring people's blood pressure, etc. Okay. And um, what would you say for the centre, the biggest challenges at the moment? Are? Uh, I think it's how we adapt to changing needs of the community, also changing policy within the health service. Because obviously we were uh, going to be aware of this more like commissioning thing. And in terms of commissioning of health services in Manchester, a lot of it is next year, well, it's, coming, it's going to be taken over by the city council. They're the main commissioner of health services and then the provider. So I think in terms of working relationship, because at the moment our commissioner is with Central Manchester Primary Care Foundation Trust, and they're also the service provider at the same time, but that division is going to be becoming more clear with the commissioner and the service provider quite separated. So we might, the challenge will be we might need to establish a newer relationship with the commissioners because one of the things that you have to explain our role quite clearly to the commissioner, because after all, if they give funding, they need to know uh, how, how do we work. And uh, like health service, I mean, in my day-to-day -day role as a health officer, every day I have to account, well, using computer system to account for my work, because this is what the commissioner needs to know, for example, how many home visits I've conducted, how many of those visits I've done, newborn children, so I suppose they were, uh, for the commissioner, they will have a set of demand, you know, I don't know, help promotion target, you know, how do you demonstrate that, so they might need some new things for us to think about how to meet those new challenges. Yeah. But that's never stopped, you know, NHS things change all the time, and we have to evolve ourselves to suit the new environment. But bearing in mind though, I think we do have a very unique services here because, after all, the staff here is able to speak the language of a majority of the client user without the use of the interpreter. Uh, and we, we have a much better cultural understanding of the needs of our Chinese community because we sure have telling us that uh, you know, the Chinese community tend to be silent uh, they're not vocal, they're not one of those go to protest a lot, to demand, you know, my right, etc. Within the wider community, the, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, the wider community. But sometimes the mainstream service provider will think, or even commissioner may think, you know, if you don't say things, that means it's, there's no need. But that's far from the truth. Although we're not saying, or they're not used to saying things, um, it does not mean there's no needs. And we are in a very good position to, as a bridge between our consumer, our client, and those people who are in the commissioning part. So I think we're playing a quite important role. We're bridging this gap, I think. I wanted to also ask, you've been in Manchester since 66, you said. Uh, well, part of the time, remember, I work for hospital and crew in Cheshire. So I, uh, for a number of years, I was away from Manchester, yeah. But, but most of the time, I, I lived in Manchester, yeah. So you have quite a long um, experience with yes. Manchester City. Um, from when you first arrived, how do you think the Manchester community and Chinatown, how do you think it's changed? Well, it's changed enormously because when I first arrived, there were not, there were not many Chinese people, not at all. And in terms of Chinese community, it was quite tiny then. And most of them are in the catering business. And then through the 1990s, 
before Hong Kong was handed over back to China. Obviously, there was some policy change in terms of Hong Kong government, the British government, and then there was some influx of those people in Hong Kong. For, for example, if they worked for the Hong Kong government, they were eligible to come over here to live, you know, whatever. And then from the 1990s, and then gradually things move on. Uh, uh, because China itself has changed, China is now, you know, is a, is a different type of economy. They seem to, lots of people have seems to have more money. And because of that, they're able to send the children, uh, particularly uh, abroad, to Britain, to boarding school or to university. So in recent years, I think the biggest change is about mainland Chinese coming into Britain and coming to Manchester because they see it as the second city. So within that context, we hear, you know, in terms of day-to-day, -day, the Chinese you met in Manchester, quite a lot of them could be from mainland China, whether they're students or even tourists, there's a large group of them coming over. So in terms of makeup of the community is changing, hence, in terms of even catering business changing, lots of more restaurants catering for the mainland, mainlanders' taste. You know, they have different food, tourists, Cantonese, they have quite a lot of spicy food, which <laughs> we don't have. So things have changed, yeah. And with more will be changed, I think. And do you think there's a stronger sense of cultural identity now? Or is it more difficult because there's so many... I, I think, th this is a, a very good question about cultural identity of Chinese. I think because Chinese... I personally you what you say the comparison would be like com Chinese as being European. Within China, there's so many different ethnic groups and different regions, and they have their own way of life, different custom, even different language. Yeah. So when you say about Chinese, although we are Chinese, but you know, Chinese, there's some certain race there. They could be, you know, the Muslim race, those Tibetans, etc. They have different culture. So I still, for myself, I still identify I, myself, even though of, after all these years being a Hong Kong Chinese. That's quite different, in my mind, to the Chinese from the mainland. Not least in terms of a language, at least, you know, in terms of Hong Kong, that least speaks mainly Cantonese. But within the sector, within the so-called Hong Kong Chinese in Manchester, a lot of them will come from the new territory part of Hong Kong, and they speak a different dialect. They speak Hakka. You know, they're coming from a farming community, but I come from a city community. Again, there's a different thing, but the differences are much less because we still identified ourselves from Hong Kong and rather than say we are Chinese from China. So there's still that cultural value. So I don't think it's a matter of unity, although we're Chinese, but there's still some uh, cultural value, I, I think, to break down between mainland and those overseas Chinese like ourselves from Hong Kong. And do you think the needs of um, Chinese people over there, Mandarin, Cantonese, uh, or Hakka speaking, have changed over the years? Uh, certainly it is, because I think eventually those... Uh, <coughs> I'm, I'm talking about, first of all, from people from Hong Kong. Uh, like my parents' generation, they die so gradually. Those not able to speak English in terms of uh, the language barrier will become less and less because they passed away. And then the second generation or even third generation like myself and my children, they certainly don't have a language barrier. So there's no need in a way for center like Chinese for them for be, being a bridge for them and the and the main service, mainstream health service provider. So now it comes to the, the second thing is that this uh, the second phase of people coming into Britain from mainland China now, then they still have quite a bit of a language problem because they speak Mandarin and they being new immigrants, they are not knowing, you know, in terms of what service is available in the community. So in that sense, Sikh Chinese still have a unique role to play because they're new settlers. And then they, they have a different thing as well. Uh, for example, if they, they, they work in the Chinese restaurant, uh, normally it's the male, you know, the father figure uh, that goes out to work and then the wife and the children will be left at home. They're, and then they're not necessarily living in the same city. 
So if the if they live in Manchester, but the husband who works as a chef, for some, for example, might be actually working in, a, in those towns like Burnley or something that's far away from Manchester, and they they stay there for for during the working week and only come home to see their wife and children perhaps only once a week on the days that they're off on the Tuesday and Wednesday, for example. So for for that reason, I think those family are more vulnerable because that, because the father is not there. That it mainly it's like a single parent family. They run with the mother and the children and then in terms of support from them is quite different from my 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 context because my parents were running a, a fish and chip together as a family unit where things are separated. The mother and the children at home, the father's working in a distance away from home and the support. Hmm. And um, just to kind of wrap it up as a, um, yeah. as a um, you're now working part time. Um, but how have you managed to find that work life balance over the years? Working part time, working part time is great because I, I can still use my skills, what I've been trained for, and still be usefully contributed to society. I think, and then. And that's my main work as a prison. And then my other work, of course, I can find a bit of more time for sick chai for example, like a volunteer uh, for the walking group on Friday. Yes, and then I'm able to see my granddaughter more often, and of course I can go on holiday more often. So in terms of retirement and working part-time, it's great for me personally. I think it's a fantastic idea. But I suppose I'm lucky. I'm a lucky guy in the, in the situation that I work for the NHS service. I have a superannuation. I got my, you know, I don't have to worry about financially. Unlike somebody uh, in the catering business, I, I think my parents didn't have any sound financial planning. Uh, you know, <clears throat> when, when they retire, when they already come up, came on, the only idea to think of was to sell, sell the chippy to get some money and then to live off that and they are not aware of uh, you know like you know, benefit thing system I think that needs help but uh, you know gradually things, things move people get better but in terms of my parents generation when they retired I don't think they actually properly planned for it you know about pension retirement what do you do I would just think sell up and perhaps return to Hong Kong My, my, my mother did, yeah, but my, my father had ill health, so he didn't, and he subsequently died in Manchester. But my mother did went back to Hong Kong to live with another, um, with my sister for a while. And, and then the money started to drink, you know, dwindle, because that's not enough, because things are quite expensive. So I thought, there's no way you can come to live in Hong Kong, you better come back to Britain. And so she did. So after, say, about 10 years after retirement, she had to come back here because the resource started to run now. You cannot live on the mess egg, so to speak. So things have changed then. And, and, and for the elderly in Manchester, we have housing association, they've got shelter housing for them. So the provision then now is so much better in terms of like back in the 70s or 80s, the early 80s. Um, and then finally, um, what do you do for recreation? What do I do? Oh, well, I, I talk about a walking already, isn't it? And the other uh, new hobby I've talked about is cycling. So I do a bit of cycling and uh, swimming. And other recreation, uh, I've told you, travelling. I love, I love to see this part of the world. And also photography. That's great. Um, that's all the questions I've got for you. Um, Okay. Um, so thanks a lot for the video. Unless okay. you'd like to add anything else. No. Thank you. That's all the questions I've got for you. So okay. Thank you.